Our scripture for today comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 26 to 27. And um, you know how the, the Bible market, we like to sell new Bibles. So there's a new translation, the new revised standard version, updated edition. Is it just a ploy to read to sell new Bibles? I don't know. But um, let us hear from scripture. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very spirit intercedes with groanings too deep for words. And God, who searches hearts, knows what is the mind of the spirit. Because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Will you join with me as we pray to God together? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And the children of God said together, amen. amen. Well, I learned a new word this week. I love when I learn a new word. It's the desire people have to do something without getting out of their chair. <laughs> it's called slacktivism. New word for you, maybe. It's when a cause is supported on social media with very little effort or commitment. You know, we like, we may even share a post. Uh, we might sign an online petition. Or, you know, we'll even change our profile photo to show our solidarity. Um, slacktivism is um, slacker activism. Slacktivism. And the phrase, thoughts and prayers, has become slacktivism because thoughts and prayers is often invoked, um, often by politicians, after a terrible tragedy. And so as we think about radical and how we can be radical, is there a way that thoughts and prayers can be radical instead of slacktivism? You know, when we hear thoughts and prayers, it's hard to take that sentiment seriously. Some of us say it, and we really mean it, uh, but we hear it so often that it feels casual or even abusive. And the essence of that phrase, it's been taken away from us as people who follow God, and I want us to reclaim it. So instead of saying apathetically, thoughts and prayers, um, is there a way that we can say, no, you have robbed us of that important expression of our faith, thoughts and prayers, are not a substitute for pursuing justice. And as our baptismal vows remind us, we accept the freedom and power that God gives us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. As Will Friend uh, said in our Wednesday morning Bible study, he said, we are God's hands. You know, we've been talking about how the radical nature of our faith um, is radical. So here is something radical for me to say this morning. Thoughts and prayers are essential to our faith and to our call to discipleship. So, you know, first let's think about our thoughts. In Romans chapter 12, uh, Paul shares these words. He says, I appeal to you, siblings, on the basis of God's mercy to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Uh, to, uh, holy and acceptable to God, which is reasonable, your reasonable act of worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern for yourselves what is the will of God, what is acceptable and good and perfect. So in our relationship with God, our thoughts, logical, sensible, help us make sense out of God's will, because the will of God is logical. That means that we should be learning about what is going on in our world, and we should be figuring out how to do the next right thing to make a difference. I remember uh, reading a Jody Pocolt book uh, called Small Great Things, and in the book, there's a Caucasian family that stops an African-American nurse from treating their child solely because of the nurse's race. So while the child is being, being treated, a Caucasian nurse has to step away, and she asks the African-American nurse uh, to watch the baby, and while she's watching the baby, the baby dies. So the nurse is put on trial, and her lawyer shares this metaphor. She says, I feel like I've been standing underneath an open window, and just as a baby gets tossed out, I grab the baby, right? Because who wouldn't? 
But then another baby gets tossed out, so I pass the baby to someone else, and they make the catch, and this keeps happening. And before you know it, there are a whole bunch of people who are getting really good at passing along babies, but just like the people who are good at catching them, no one ever asks, who is throwing the babies out the window in the first place? You know, so much is happening in our world that we deal with the most immediate crisis, and we don't stop and look at the big picture. And sometimes we have to look at the system instead of catching whatever falls out the window at any given moment. In Isaiah chapter 1, uh, 17, God calls us and tells us, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow, do justice, and stand up for what is right, even when others don't. That means that we should care about people's access to food and water. That means that we should care about education, not just for our own children, but for all children. We should care about a lack of jobs and a lack of affordable housing in our city. Compassion calls us to provide food to the homeless, but justice, justice calls us to address the systemic reasons for why there is the existence of a, a permanent underclass of people who are homeless. Justice calls us to fight against government policies that increase suffering, justice calls us to speak truth to power. You know, we're called to, to make justice happen as we welcome refugees, as we heal a broken planet, as we feed the hungry and give water to those who are thirsty, as we build bridges of trust, not walls of fear. You know, we're called to do justice, to bring about God's vision for a world where the weak are protected, where none go hungry. And it takes courage to do justice. It takes courage to speak truth to power. And the chasm is deep between justice and injustice. So prayer, prayer helps us to be brave. I remember the, the first time that I was gonna do a, a, a pastor thing. And I was an intern um, and I was just gonna read the call to worship. I didn't even have to come up with anything. I just had to read it. And my voice was shaking, and my knees were shaking, and I was like, they got to call somebody else. I can't do this. And I prayed, and I stood up, and my voice wasn't shaking, and my knees weren't shaking, and prayer helped me to be brave. You know, when we pray, we're able to do our, ve our very best spiritual thinking because prayer is the way that we experience our interaction with God. Prayer helps us to enter into dialogue with God. You know, sometimes we don't think we know how to pray. We don't know what to say. So we come to God and we are speechless. Or we're so overwhelmed with our pain or our grief or our sense of abandonment that our capacity to communicate with God becomes paralyzed. In our scripture today, Paul says that when we are incapable of prayer, God's spirit prays for us. God prays for us. When we don't have the right way, the right words to pray, when we don't know, you know how to hold our hands in a particular way, um, God's spirit is in dialogue with our spirit. There is never a moment when God is out of touch with us. There is never a moment when God is out of touch with us, even when we feel like we are out of touch with God, because God knows everything that is going on in our hearts. God knows everything that is going on in our souls. Unfortunately, there's not a little box that says, don't come here, God. God knows everything. And prayer is when we listen to that dialogue that is happening between our spirit and God's spirit. Prayer is when we pay attention to what God is telling us in response to whatever is going on in our minds. You know, there's a proverb that says, when you pray, move your feet. Prayer always involves response and action. So we may think that prayer is talking to God. We may think that prayer is telling God what to do. But prayer is listening to what God wants us to do. When I think of the moments in my life that really defined me, uh, my stepdad's death when I was 17 really tops the list. <laughs> Uh, his death at that crucial time in my life taught me that life is precious, and it inspired me to seek to do something in the world that makes a difference. 
You know, what the church taught me was that we show up for one another and we hold each other up in prayer. So when my stepdad was life flighted to the hospital after his car accident, my mom called the church. Uh, the pastor on staff called the choir director since my mom and stepdad sang in the choir and then the choir phone tree was activated. And all these people from the church started to show up at the hospital. My stepdad was in surgery all night long, and all night long, these people from our church waited with us. No one knew what the outcome would be, and the church did not run from death. The church stood right beside us, right beside death. The church said, we are with you. You are not alone. So people from church held my hand. They said that they loved me. They said that they were there for me, and their presence with us that night as we waited and waited and waited, showed me that God was there, making that unimaginable tragedy bearable. In the presence of those people, God was supporting and caring for and loving me and my family. God, with, God was with us. You know, though, though we may walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil because God is with us. God's ra- rod and God's staff comforts us. God prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. God anoints our head with oil. Our cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So today, after you receive the bread and the juice for communion, you can be anointed with oil as a reminder for us that God heals us and that you are beloved child of God. So Dara, retired clergy who grew up at White Rock and has come home, and I will anoint your head um, with oil, making the sign of the cross on your forehead. It's totally optional, but it's really cool. May our thoughts and prayers, may our holy communion, may our laying on of hands, may our anointing with oil today be healing for you. You know, the Greek word for healing in the New Testament is sozo, S-O-Z-O, And it's the same root word as the words for salvation and the words for wholeness. So spiritual healing is God's work of offering us wholeness of body and mind and spirit. Now, it shouldn't detract from the gifts that God gives through medicine and uh, psychotherapy. Jesus loves me, this I know, for he gave me Lexapro. You know, my hope is that this anointing with oil will add to our total resources for wholeness. So we bring to God our brokenness. We bring anything that weighs us down. We bring our concerns for others. We bring our concerns for our world. And we come to God who knows our needs before we ask, whose love is revealed in Jesus the Christ, who is stronger than suffering and death. We come seeking salvation and wholeness. May we be reminded that we are marked as a blessed child of God, always. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.